Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akkari Dunwali, the headlines. Multiple strikes of missiles have been reported in the western city of Lviv this morning, while air raid sirens were heard in Kiev and other parts of Ukraine. As Ukraine braces for a new Russian assault in the east, President Zelensky promises not to give up any territory, says Ukraine will put off a tough resistance in the east. And dog therapy brings solace to displaced Ukrainian children. Authorities in Ukraine have reported multiple explosions in the western and southern regions of Lviv and Dnipropetrovsk, and this is according to media network Al Jazeera. Andrei Sadovoy, the mayor of Lviv, said in a Twitter post that there had been five targeted missile strikes on the city, while Valentin Reznichenko, the governor of Dnipropetrovsk, uh, reported attacks earlier this morning, but said most of the missiles had been shot down by Ukrainian air defense systems. There was no immediate information about casualties or damage. In the meantime, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said that Ukraine is not willing to give up territory in the eastern part of the country to end the war with Russia and is preparing to offer tough resistance in the face of an expected large-scale offensive in the east. President Zelensky told an exclusive interview broadcast that the eight uh, that a fight for the eastern Donbas region could shape the outcome of the war in its entirety, warning that Russia could try to seize Kyiv if it captures the Donbas region. And in Mariupol, an advisor to the mayor says that Russian troops are issuing movement passes to those who remain in the city. Petro Andrushenko made the allegation via telegram, sharing a photo that appears to show people aligning up. According to him, hundreds of citizens have to stand in line to get a pass, without which next week it will be impossible to move between districts of the city and also to be on the streets. Uh, Mr. Petro suggested that occupying forces were probably gathering information on or filtering through those who remain in the city. Russia claims to have control of most of the city, with Ukrainian defenders uh, reportedly contained to a sprawling industrial area called the Azovstal Steelworks. Russian officials offered to spare the lives of those troops if they surrendered on Sunday, an offer which was ignored. The Crimean Human Rights Group says the Russian military has forcibly removed some 150 children from Mariupol. These included 100 sick and wounded children who were in the hospital, and that's according to the group, adding that they were transferred in the direction of occupied Donetsk and the Russian city of Taganrog. Petro uh, Andrushenko, who we uh, talked about earlier, said the children were taken out of the hospitals without their parents, adding that they were not orphans. The Ombudsman for Human Rights in Ukraine has previously said more than 120,000 children have been forcibly deported to Russia uh, from Ukraine. Residents of Mariupol in the meantime walked past the bodies of civilians as they evacuated their destroyed homes as Moscow said its forces had almost completely seized the port town. Ukrainian soldiers resisted the Russian ultimatum to lay down arms in Mariupol and Prime Minister Denis Shimhal said the city had not been entirely taken by Russian forces. Earlier, Russia said it had control over banned areas, with some Ukrainian fighters remaining in the Azovstal steelworks overlooking the Sea of Azov. Capturing Mariupol, the main port in the Donbas region, would be a strategic prize for Russia, connecting territory held by pro-Russian separatists in the east with the Crimea region that Moscow annexed in 2014. About 4 million Ukrainians have fled the country, cities have been shattered, and thousands uh, have died since the start of the invasion on February the 24th. And the mayor of Bravari, Igor Shapotsko, said a missile attack has damaged infrastructure in his city, which is near the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. There were no details on the extent of the destruction and potential casualties, but the mayor also warned residents not to go out and film the aftermath of the attack or those affected.
Russian troops have again shot down a Ukrainian military transport plane near Odessa, which was carrying weapons supplied by the Western countries, according to Russia's Ministry of Defense. The spokesman, Igor Konoshenkov, told the news briefing that a plane was used to transport a large amount of weapons supplied by Western countries uh, to Ukraine. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said that the Russian Foreign Minister had sent a diplomatic note to all countries, including the United States, regarding arming Ukraine. And British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has wished Christians around the world a happy Easter, but Mr. Johnson delivered a special message to Ukrainian Christians who celebrated uh, the Easter. Easter today and the Orthodox Easter later on in the month, telling them to be strong and have courage in their hearts. His message comes as tensions in the port area of Mariupol remain high. Russia gave holdout soldiers an ultimatum to lay down arms in the southwestern city, which Moscow said its forces had nearly completed control of in what would be the biggest capture of the nearly two months old war. And good over evil. Those around the world facing fear of persecution forced to celebrate their saviour's rebirth in secret. And of course, the Christians of Ukraine, whether they're marking Easter today or its orthodox equivalent later this month, for whom Christ's message of hope, the triumph of life over death and good over evil, will resonate this year perhaps more than any other. Easter tells us that there is light beyond the darkness that beyond the suffering lies redemption. And so, this Easter, Budisilni imaci vesetsi odvahu, visi hto povajci na hospoda. Let's talk now to Charles Adiogun Phillips. Mr. Phillips is a former international criminal court prosecutor who joins us uh, virtually. Good morning to you. Thank you for your time. Morning, laddie. How are you? Happy Easter. Happy Easter to you too. How are activities and actions in situations of war or conflict defined? Uh, we have heard loosely in different statements uh, some actions being described as war crimes, some uh, as crimes against humanity, and others still as genocide. Well, um, there are four international crimes that are relevant to the atrocities and the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Those crimes are the, prime, the war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the international crime of aggression. Um, Crimes against humanity are described as certain acts that are purposefully committed by a state or on behalf of the state as part of a widespread and systematic policy, which is targeted essentially at civilians in times of peace or war. Um, it's, it's the violent nature of such acts that makes them uh, being considered as a breach of human rights, hence the name a crime against humanity. On the other hand, war crimes are essentially violations of international humanitarian law, either by treaty or by customary international law, uh, that incur individual criminal responsibility under international law. Uh, these atrocities are often committed against a civilian population, but they usually are con uh, con conducted during war. Uh, a war crime could include murder, extermination, enslavement, and deportation or even mass systematic rape. Genocide, on the other hand, are considered as acts that are committed with an intention to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, or racial group or religious group identified as such. So what is peculiar about a genocide and what makes it very, very difficult to prove is that you have to demonstrate that there was an intention to destroy, in whole or in part, members of a group. So those are the essential elements. The crime of aggression, of course, uh, is based on the, the invasion of, 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 uh, of one country uh, by another. So there are four international crimes that will be applicable here. 
Given uh, the way you've defined them, I, I, am I right to presume then that how you go about investigating and prosecuting uh, this four are different? Indeed, because the, the, elements, the elements of the crimes are different. For example, um, a crime against humanity will differ from a war crime because a crime against humanity are not isolated acts or sporadic events committed by individual soldiers. Rather, a crime against humanity are acts committed in furtherance of a state or government policy. Um, it has to be condoned by a government. Now, secondly, war crimes, unlike war crimes, crimes against humanity can be committed both during peacetime and during a war. A crime against humanity, a war crime rather, can only be committed during a war. Now, also a war crime would also most likely be committed by individual soldiers or members of armed forces during uh, a time of war. Now, like I said, a genocide is, is very unique in that to prove a genocide, it has to have been the killing or the, 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 the killing of an individual must have been committed with a special intent, what we call in international criminal law, the dodo specialis, it's a special intent to destroy in whole or in part members of a group. And that the targeting of members of that group must be based on either national, ethnic, racial, or religious grounds. And that group has to be identified as such. So for example, using the case of Nigeria, um, for, 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 for armed forces or for people to have committed a genocide, members of a group such as the Yorubas, there must have been an intention to destroy that Yoruba group in whole or in part. So that special intention is what distinguishes a genocide from any of the other crimes. So they're all different in terms of the elements that, um, that um, support um, the prosecution of those crimes, yes. With the war in Ukraine in particular and the current inability of neutral or independent mm -hmm. observers to get in and assess the situation mm -hmm. on the ground, how easy or difficult would it be to sustain accusations of any of these genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, international crimes uh, of aggression, when the conflict eventually winds down? Because it does appear as if that cannot be investigated uh, while the conflict is still on. Actually, it can, um, and that's, that's perhaps what um, distinguishes the ongoing conflict in uh, Ukraine from many of the atrocities that I have in, in investigated as head of special investigations at the UN. The investigation of violations in an active conflict, which was previously life-threatening, has now become a lot easier, thanks to what we call open-source investigation techniques. Now, you wouldn't believe how easy it is in the days of digital mobile phones, digital equipments that are uploaded on social media by combatants themselves. Um, and uh, and these, these videos are of such high resolution that they can be used um, as evidence in, in a criminal uh, uh, prosecution. But more importantly, there is an increased use of satellite uh, imagery uh, satellite imagery, as, as we've seen in, in this conflict, has been used a lot. When we, when we investigated um, the Rwandan uh, conflict 25 years ago, there was very limited use of satellite imagery. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, France and the U.S. had that, and we had to rely on the U.S. government to supply us with satellite imagery. But that, that now is readily available. Drones are flying all over the place. So it's, it's, a, it's actually very possible these days to actually capture um, events that are occurring real time. Now, there are quite a few techniques that investigators can use um, in documenting and preserving the evidence, uh, irrespective of the fact that they are unable to gain access to the territory because of an active conflict. I've mentioned the, op the, the use of open source inter intelligence which is uh, going to hospitals, looking at uh, infrastructure that is targeted uh, by the opposition forces, looking at places like hospitals and schools, the use of cluster bombs, the desecration of uh, uh, the remains of civilians or even fighters. 
the use of war, war crimes, sexual violence. Sexual violence is used as a tool of war, and that has been prevalent in every war. So um, the use of open source intelligence is, can help gather the information, irrespective of the fact that you're unable to gain access. The use of um, the ability to verify those sources. Again, I've mentioned the use of so social media. Um, one has to be, it's, it's one thing to collect the imagery and to collect the evidence. It's another thing to be able to verify the evidence. So you would find that um, it's necessary for investigators using various metadata tools to be able to verify. But it's also important for investigators to be able to archive um, this evidence. Because you see, um, like I said, they, they, they exist on social media and they can be deleted by Twitter, by Facebook, just like that. So as, as you come into, uh, as you gather the evidence and you find the evidence, you then archive it. And this is, this is very interesting for what we did in Syria um, many years ago. When you find the, the, the evidence, the digital evidence, you then need to find eyewitnesses that are capable of corroborating so it's one thing to find um, a video going around of soldiers doing things or bodies lying in a place. You'd now need eyewitnesses to be able to, to corroborate and to speak to those, to those videos. You also need to be able to identify um, uh, perpetrators. Um, and there's so many techniques um, of identifying perpetrators. Where did the soldiers come from? Was there something unique about their uniforms? Did they have any insignia? The weapons used, were they derived from a certain uh, manufacturer of weapons, the tanks? Did they have any inscription on them, which would help investigators um, denote and decipher that um, these tanks and this ammunition belong to one side or the other? But like I said, the use of... Um, Satellite imagery is very important in tracking the movement of forces. So you see, one of the things we use in international criminal investigation is to be able to say, well, these detachments of forces were located at this um, location at a particular time and then tie them down to the atrocities that were committed at that location. And I'm sure you would have been familiar with a lot of satellite imagery showing the movement of Russian tanks in certain yes. areas um, in, in Ukraine. These imageries should not be taken for granted. They are, they are, they are, they are very useful. The analysis of... Mr. Adeogu, I'm sorry to interrupt you. My, my apologies. I'm sorry. To, we're, we're due for a quick break. Uh, when we come back, mm -hmm. you finish that thought and I'll ask uh, the other part of the questions uh, that I still have for you. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Uh, Mr. Charles Adeogo Phillips, former ICC prosecutor, is still our guest uh, from uh, uh, Victor Island here in Lagos, joining us uh, virtually. Uh, Mr. Adeogo, before uh, Phillips, before the break, you were just concluding the fact that, uh, you know, it's one thing to gather the material, it's another thing to verify. But even there, with verification, there are tools that can help. Uh, and. Uh, how you go about using those tools will also be critical into how the matter is eventually uh, proceeded with. But crimes of this nature uh, are prosecuted, investigated by the ICC, uh, but a number of the parties in this particular conflict, uh, talking about the one in Ukraine, they are not signatories uh, to the Rome Statute, which set up the ICC. Uh, is it possible, perhaps, that uh, a non-signatory can bring a case before the ICC for investigation and prosecution? Yes, it is. But before I answer that, let me start off by saying that the likelihood of President Putin standing trial as a serving head of state is extremely slim. That said, if the Russian government, the current Russian government, falls, and he is then removed from office and extradited, and extradited by the new regime with more cordial relations with the international community, then, of course, that would happen. Um, we're all witnesses to the case in Sudan and how difficult it has been to bring President al-Bashir Ab to be accountable for his atrocities in Darfur. Now, can the ICC make President Putin accountable for the invasion of Ukraine? In theory... In theory, yes. In practice, no. Now, 
President Putin's actions in targeting Ukrainians in 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 uh, in targeting civilians in Ukraine constitute war crimes. So that are crimes against humanity under international law. So it is possible for the ICC prosecutor to proceed with an investigation of these crimes, because even though Ukraine is not a party to the Rome Statute of the ICC, it had previously accepted the court's jurisdiction in 2014 in connection with Russia's invasion of uh, Crimea, which you rightly pointed out. It then went on to accept at the ICC's jurisdiction on an open-ended basis. So the ICC has both the subject matter and the temporal jurisdiction over these events. Now, um, that said, I'm not sure that it can be shown um, through the evidence that the, the, the certain acts that were committed in Ukraine were committed with an intention to destroy in whole or in part Ukrainians as a national or racial group. So I worry about the sustainability of a genocide charge. Genocide is the crime of crimes. It's very, very, very rare to prove. But his actions in, in, in invading Ukraine also constitute a violation of the international crime of aggression. Now, I have you know that the crime of aggression has never been prosecuted. It only exists on paper. And there's, there's certain limitations to the ICC's ability to prosecute uh, Mr. Putin for the crime of aggression. Because on the face of it, invading Ukraine would suggest that Russia is guilty of the crime of aggression. But there, there, there are certain limitations. And those limitations are this. The, the first limitation is that the alleged aggressor, in this case Russia, must be a state party to the Rome Statute of the ICC. Russia is not a state party to the ICC, and therefore its citizens cannot be prosecuted by the court for this specific offense. And this is limited to the crime of aggression. So there are other options. I don't know how much time we have, but there are other options that could be pursued. And you must have heard talk about the creation of a special international tribunal just to prosecute Putin for the crime of aggression. The, the, the idea being that that international tribunal will take care of the crime of aggression, whilst the ICC will take care of the other violations of international criminal law, such as uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes. The general idea is that both institutions will, will, will run parade to So in a nutshell, that, 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 that is the answer to your question. My, my final question to you in this segment, uh, I wish we had more time, but I, 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 I want to find out that you have mentioned how this is supposed to proceed. Uh, but mm -hmm. assuming, and you've also talked about the technology available, but there are countries which have, in the run-up to this uh, discussion, which have said that, you know, observers should be allowed to go in and actually examine the physical evidence on the ground, uh, uh, see mm -hmm. all the various things on the ground. Now, if they get mm -hmm. in, if that ever happens, um, before most of the evidence is removed or destroyed, uh, either directly or inadvertently, what are some of the things that you know they'd be looking out for um, okay. it, it, within the grounds? Yeah, well, it is, as, it is as clear as night follows day that there have been serious violations of international humanitarian law by the Russian military and or its leadership. That's, that's clear. It's all over the news. So very quickly, if I was directing those investigations, they, they, would, they would cover three main areas. The first area I have alluded to is deriving eyewitness testimony from the survivors of some of this attack and trying to match the digital evidence, which would have been recorded either the, the use of satellite imagery or, or through drones or uh, electronic um, materials such as mobile phones, trying to match those to eyewitness testimony. The second would consist of detailed forensic evidence. And the third would consist of obtaining intelligence from insider witnesses. Now, let's, let me tell you a bit about um, what I consider forensic evidence. Now, forensic, forensic evidence will consist of exhumation of mass graves and the examination and documentation of what was contained in those mass graves. When I was um, involved in the Rwanda genocide, one of the first things that we had to do upon taking on that job was to be present as forensic examiners 
would dig up mass graves. And the whole, the whole idea was to be able to identify as prosecutors who the victims of those crimes were by virtue of their sexes, the clothes they were wearing. Luckily for us, the soil in Rwanda was so rich, so the bodies had not decomposed to a state where we couldn't recognize them. And we were able, we, with the assistance of eyewitnesses who could identify their relatives or the remains of their relatives in these mass graves, we begin to start to pick, pin together a picture of what took place in a particular location. Forensic evidence would also consist of the examination of ballistic evidence and the ballistic in terms of the weapons that were used. You need ballistic experts to be able to speak to the origins of those weapons. Where were they manufactured? Um, who, who, who Are they banned uh, by the UN? Where, where, what's the country of origin? We would need the help of NATO allies to be able to examine this. But more importantly is the use of satellite imagery. Satellite imagery with the help of NATO allies will help locate the movement of Russian forces at a particular location, at a particular time, and that would enable investigators to be able to tie them to the atrocities that took place um, at that location. Indeed, uh, but all of this, of course, uh, is for those who are waiting and prepared to do this, uh, but we'll have to wait and see, uh, uh, Mr. Adeogo Phillips. Thank you so much uh, for, for the perspective. We'll bring you back uh, when uh, we have uh, a lot more facts and less heat uh, yeah. about this uh, to talk about what is going on then. For, for now, thank you so much for your time this morning. And once again, thank, uh, compliments on the season. Thank you. Let's talk uh, next to Major General Pat Akem, who is a security expert, uh, leadership and strategic consultant. He joins us uh, from our Abuja studios. Uh, good morning, uh, General Akem. Thank you for your time. Compliments of the season to you. Thank you, Larry. Com compliments. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I, I, in our own discussion, I, I want us to focus a bit on the strategy here. Um, the Ukrainians are putting up uh, stiff defense, as is expected of anybody defending his or her country. Uh, the Russians have pulled back uh, to particular areas, but there are some other areas uh, that they're not giving up. For example, the port city of Mariupol, and um, they're also occasionally still dealing blows uh, on Kiev itself, which is the capital of the country. It, it, do you, as a military man, do you see a strategy in all of this? Uh, is there a way of looking at this uh, for it to make sense? Well, you see, this, this uh, war, even though Putin does not call it war, uh, looks like the case of David and Goliath in the Bible. Um, if you look at the armed forces, the composition, you will discover that uh, Russia is the second largest military force on Earth, second only to the United States of America. How does Ukraine rank? Very far down the ladder. Um, for instance, uh, land forces, the army, the Russians have about 900,000, Ukrainians 250,000. So to hold the ground the way they are holding, you will, think, you will conclude that something has gone wrong. Maybe there was an overestimation of what the Russians were to do. So from a strategic point of view, uh, it would appear that uh, failing to take this, the, the capital the way they wanted within two days of invasion uh, to destroy the Ukrainian armed forces, remove the government, install a government that was maybe more conducive to the thinkings and the uh, plannings of the Kremlin, uh, it looks as if that has failed and uh, Russia is trying to, to play the second card, which perhaps is limited now to the eastern part, where you take the Donbass region, control it, deny Ukraine access to the Black Sea, and then maybe later on, again, move on the capital if uh, the conditions permit. But right now, it looks like the Ukrainian forces are holding their ground. And uh, I must quickly say that, you know, if there is anything that can serve to fortify and um, push troops to do something the way the Ukrainians are fighting, it's hatred. Hatred that comes as a result of uh, the atrocities that are being alleged to be committed in war, uh, rapes, the feeling of patriotism 
so that that hatred becomes a treasure and i think that is what the ukrainian forces and the, the citizens are, are using so basically uh, russia needs to rethink its strategy and i think they are doing that they are trying to scale it down and limit their objectives now you've talked about from the russian side i want to take a look at this from the ukrainian side now as you said um at the beginning of this conflict the ukrainians were definitely the david in the equation and uh, very few people expected them uh, to come this far with this kind of uh, resistance, uh, particularly against a country like Russia. But they have. They've had support from uh, some of the key countries in the West, uh, the United States, Britain, and e the EU have sent them a lot of weapons. They're still asking for a lot more. But if you, if you, were, if, if you were the Ukrainian leader and have the situation as you have it on the board, uh, now, do you think he is in a good position or that the country is in a good position now to go for negotiation? Because so many people have said every day that the war goes on, the country gets more and more destroyed. Uh, its infra infrastructure, its people and all of that are, are deeply affected. That where it is now, is, does it have enough leverage to go for negotiations given the kind of resistance that it has put up? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much. I think President Zelensky has not hidden his desire to, to negotiate. The only condition that he uh, red line, no-go area, is perhaps to give away part of his territory. He has consistently maintained that no inch of the territory called Ukraine will be given out. Otherwise, other than that, he's prepared, even up to yesterday, to negotiate. The, the, the challenge is Russia needs to go away with something that shows that it has won. When you are the second largest armed force in the world and you come against a small nation like Ukraine, which is armed forces, you want to exert a price that saves face, saves your face, that shows that you are still a big player. So, yes, Ukraine is prepared to negotiate, but what will Russia accept? Russia wants, at least in the minimum, from what I've read and from what I've observed, in the minimum, to hold the eastern part of Ukraine, create a land bridge, and then deny the Ukrainians access to the Red Sea. And I want to quickly add that what I'm seeing is going to result in a battle of attrition, where the Ukrainians keep fighting and the Russians keep fighting. Now, if this thing goes beyond a year, the question will arise as to whether the international community, America, NATO nations supporting Ukraine, whether they will keep on sending the resources, because without those resources, Ukraine cannot survive. Uh, would that be possible with, with the uh, Americans lose interest, especially if Congress changes hands and the Republicans take over? And of course, we've seen from their voting concerning Ukraine, the, uh, concerning NATO, that they're not too, uh, too keen about it. I mean, in the last week, 62 Republicans voted against the, the motion to, to strengthen uh, NATO. So if that were to happen with the Ukrainian state fight, I would say yes, on a scaled down level, uh, the battle of attrition will go on. They will get the, the Russians bogged down for a long time. So basically I think Ukraine, uh, uh, Zelensky wants to negotiate with Russians accept the conditions that he's given. Uh, it's an open question, but I've got, looking at Putin's statements and body language, I think no. So there is a time, there's a time schedule to all of this. Um, I, 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 apart from all the other considerations, there's a time schedule, and politics will come to play a role in all of this, especially the politics of the supporting countries uh, to Ukraine, and uh, even those who are not supporting Ukraine. Uh, it's a function of time. That's what I get from what you've said. But then that then moves on. Uh, we have heard before that the whole idea is for Russia to get bogged down and that the Western powers want to, quote and unquote, bleed Russia enough uh, before they, you know, support uh, President Zelensky uh, to go back to negotiating uh, when they believe that Russia is sufficiently weakened. In the long run, considering the other people or the other countries that are planning or have now resumed planning uh, to move westwards, the likes of Sweden and Finland, uh, at the end of the day, is this 
are we not going to have uh, a sense of deja vu when this keeps repeating itself? I, I, I think I think that uh, you know when you stay in power for too long, uh, uh, President Putin has been there for 22 years. It gets to a level where you begin to think you are invincible, that you are some kind of god, that you can do anything. I think he has miscalculated. You, 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 Ukraine had no chance of joining NATO. They, had, they, they were turned down some years ago, about 10 years ago. Um, you come up with a contrary reason to fight, and you, you, you say it's because they are trying to join NATO. But there are other nations, the Baltic nations, uh, um, Croatia, North Macedonia, um, um, Latvia, Lithuania, and, and a host of others that are within the region and are members of NATO. So you are in now increasing the number because everybody is afraid now if we do not join NATO, Russia has the tendency to invade. I mean, 12 years ago, they invaded, invaded uh, South Georgia. Uh, they, they've been involved in, in Syria. So you, you, you made nations to become afraid and they are now moving away. And it's been a miscalculation. And I, I, I agree with you totally that the idea is to lead Russia to a point where they can no longer, already, already they've been mystified. Uh, I can tell you on the talk with, with all, all sense of, or with, uh, tell you that if it were a conventional war between Russia, NATO, those NATO nations who have around Russia within, within months, from what I have seen, without, without conventional, without the use of nuclear weapons. So I think that it, it has played into the hands of nations that want to withhold down its powers. And if I were uh, advising Putin, uh, you take the best price you can take, court, and then maybe re-strategize. But the way it is going, of course, maybe he's waiting for NATO to crack. Because if uh, Marie Le Pen wins the election in, in France, her agenda is different. Um, Victor Orban of Hungary, his agenda is different. So perhaps to crack NATO apart and then maybe uh, continue to exert the influence, the hegemony he wants to exert within the region. But basically, the other nations want Russia's power and influence with it down to the barest minimum. And, and, and the sanctions are devastating. It, in about two years down the line, the, the effect of the sanction will become terrible, terribly devastating, and uh, uh, Russia will begin to feed the, the pinch of its actions. Indeed, uh, General uh, Akim, we will bring you back to take a look at this uh, in, in the near future. But for now, it's uh, just enough for me to say thank you so much for your time on this Easter Monday and wish you uh, the rest uh, of uh, the day to be good. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the honor. Thank, thank you so much. Business is partially resumed in food markets in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, after Russian troops pulled back from the city in spite of warnings from Moscow that it might strike again on the capital following Ukraine's cross-border attacks. Half of the shops in the Troshkina marketplace, one of the biggest markets in Kiev, are closed due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict that broke out on February the 24th. But the stalls run by Ala Menchik and Oleksiy Klushik stay open. They say they want to be present and deliver a message that people should help each other during the toughest of times. The Troshna market used to be a popular spot for residents getting their daily food and other necessities. But due to an interruption in deliveries, consumers only had very little selection when it comes to basic foods like onions and potatoes. Vendors say as the roads to Kiev have been reopened now, more food options are slowly making people return. Still ahead on the program, Swiss sports minister calls on International Olympic Committee to suspend officials from Russia and Belarus. Please stay with us.
Thanks for staying tuned. Uh, time to take a look at the business. And uh, the Nigeria Economic Summit Group has warned of the implications of the Russia-Ukraine war, citing tensions that have triggered a global supply chain disruptions largely affecting countries, including Nigeria, exposed to trade with the warring nations. Uh, to take a look at this and what the NESG is recommending, Ladi joins me uh, on the program. Compliments of the season, Ladi. I, I trust you had a good Easter yeah, weekend. Uh, so, the NESG uh, is talking about the war here and uh, supply chain disruptions. We've been discussing that exactly, ever yeah. since this started. Yeah. So, what are they asking? And, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, commodity prices... You go know, here go, while yeah, go inflation go. become a concern. Yes, just, so, what, uh, what, what are they saying? That so, we what do? they're saying now is, you know what, uh, these are challenging times. You know, let's uh, uh, look at how we can secure food, you know, for the nation at this point, you know, leverage on uh, the uh, AFCFTA agreement, you know, see how you can uh, control the borders and make sure, you know, what we need actually stays, you know, in Nigeria at this point. They're also uh, telling the government, you know, remove some of most of this, you know, agricultural constraints, you know, when it comes to uh, security at this right. point. We've seen how that has disrupted uh, the flow of uh, some of these uh, agricultural foods, you know, to these parts, you know, and, you know, around the country. So they're saying, you know, we'll tackle insecurity, make sure that, make sure, you know, agriculture, uh, agricultural products moves, move freely, you know, within the country. And we're actually saving what we need, you know, for the future. We're not exporting food at this time at least we have something that you know nigerians can actually have to fall back on you know and start planning you know ways to make sure that food security is not a problem you know for this nation at this point because we've seen countries like egypt you know north african countries actually uh we've seen their bread uh, their wheat uh, subsidy actually skyrocket at this absolutely, point absolutely because you know, of the prices because of prices so what they're saying is you know what let's tackle you know, agriculture at this point, let's make sure uh, we leverage the AFCFT agreement to make sure that our trade, you know, goes well. And, you know, obviously we trade with these warring countries. We have to find, you know, alternatives at this point so we don't get, you know, on the wrong side of sanctions, you know, dealing with, uh, with a country like Russia. Now, uh, this is week nine. Uh, hardly anyone thought that uh, this war would go on. Uh, this long either way, but uh, in the in the UK, furniture prices are headed up as well. Yes, because of well, they're warning that okay, we're seeing timber prices actually uh, rise at this point, and that's one of the major inputs, you know, for uh, sofas and uh, furniture in the UK. And they're saying, you know what, consumers should brace for higher prices. You know, at this point, because we're seeing the war actually disrupt, you know, flow of uh, timber, you know, to the UK at this point, because and the prices of timber actually going up. So at, at that translates to higher prices, you know, for uh, furniture. We're also seeing energy cost, you know, prices yeah, also actually go up I have at this that point. Here, that, uh, yeah, again, three week highs. A three What's week driving high. that now? So at this point is is supply disruption. We're seeing, you know, uh, the the West actually more and more sanctions, you know, and try to wean off. Russian oil and gas at this point. So, you know, the, you know how the market reacts. Once there's a disruption, the market prices that into, you know, uh, oil prices and the price of gas. So we're seeing prices actually elevated this morning with oil. oil Brent oil hit about $112.79 a barrel this morning. And obviously, once oil goes up, we're seeing energy prices rise. That domino effect Almost keeps immediately. On going. Almost immediately. It, it doesn't take a second. The markets react immediately once there's a disruption, you know, with the Russian supply at this point. Bitcoin, uh, on the other hand, it's a bit muted in its reaction. Yeah, we, we've seen prices. You seem surprised by that, it, because yeah, I was. because <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, traders were saying, all right, this weekend we could see some kind of relief rally, you know, but we didn't see that. We didn't see any relief rally. We saw Bitcoin price range, you know, between uh, the 40 and 41,000 range. But now we have a major pullback this morning. And it's it's basic, uh, basic, you know, economics at this point. You know, once there are uh, any uh, uncertainties, we see tr uh, traders run away from risky assets. And we obviously we know uh, crypto is a very 
a risky, risky asset. asset class, you know, at this point. So we've seen uh, the price pull back at this uh, this morning. It's down to about $38,000, you know, from uh, 41, From 41 on Friday. Yes, on Friday. So we see the kind of big swings, you know, in that market. It is expected, but we see our, our U.S. markets are closed at this point for the holidays. The NASDAQ is closed. But obviously, when we're, we're expecting a pullback and opening and the crypto market is already leading the charge, you know, with the pullbacks at this point. So uh, it's going to be quite an interesting week, you know, for the market. Interesting you know, is one traders, way to describe it. <laughs> yeah, traders need to brace up. It's going to be quite uh, a seesaw movement, you know, we're expecting in the market for this week. And just before I let you go, the, the, last week, Friday, I was talking to Ine about beauty and the shops, the Luxitan, exactly, which Luxitan. decided that it wasn't going to... Uh, close its shops in Russia uh, because of its staff. Right. And they had to take a U-turn because uh, if you go on Twitter, <laughs> there was a, a huge backlash on social media. You know, most of the customers were disappointed. They say, how can you uh, see what, you know, Russia is doing, you know, to the Ukrainians and you still want to keep on doing business with them? And, you know, there was a lot of backlash. We saw uh, customers on, on, on Twitter there, you know, saying they're disappointed you know, the brand, and obviously we know how brand perception is, is quite, is important. You know, you don't want your brand perceived in, you know, a negative way. And, you know, the, the customers were saying, you know, we're going to boycott, you know, your, your products at this point. So uh, we saw uh, Luxitan actually take a U-turn and say, you know what, we're going to uh, stop, you know, most of our businesses in Russia. The board, you know, took that decision quickly you know, on Friday, and uh, we've seen the effect of that, and they're actually moving ahead to pull out at this point. They don't care about uh, saving those uh, <laughs> workers at this point. They're it's not, all about the brand right now. It's all about the brand. Thank you, uh, Laddie, and uh, again, compliments. Uh, uh, compliments season. Season. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's talk some uh, sports here, where the Swiss sports minister, Viola Ahmed, has written to the International Olympic Committee IOC to suspend officials uh, from Russia and Belarus. The IOC had recommended that international federations ban athletes and officials from both countries from their competitions after Russia had invaded uh, uh, Ukraine. However, the positions of the Russian IOC members Shamil Tapishev and two-time Olympic pole vault gold medalist Yelena Izambayeva have remained unaffected. Russian and Belarusian officials are also permitted to continue serving on IOC commissions. Her letter adds further pressure on the IOC to act following declaration from more than 30 sports ministers last month calling from the exclusion from international uh, sports uh, bodies. And uh, while we talk about this, uh, let us um, move on to something and end this uh, with something that is uh, Slightly uplifting. Yevzel, a black and a white a spaniel, waits patiently as kids gather around to pet him every day. He is part of a dog therapy session in eastern Ukraine where canines help children adjust to a life after war. Yevzel is one of 28 dogs at a humanitarian aid center in Zaporizhia where children also draw. Uh, sing nursery rhymes and receive psychological support. Another dog, Melo, has arrived at the same humanitarian center alongside his owner, Daniel Shevchenko, who traveled hundreds of miles from eastern Ukraine to flee bombardment. Uh, many of the refugees have come from regions further east where the bulk of the fighting between Ukraine and Russian forces is taking place. Humanitarian center. Alongside owner, Daniel Savchenko, who traveled hundreds of miles from eastern Ukraine to flee bombardment and other humanitarian aid. Many of the refugees have come from regions further east, where the bulk of the fighting between Ukrainian and Russian forces is taking place. And that's a wrap indeed on the program this morning. Thanks for being with us. I'm Ladi Akiri Dulwali. There's an update at five later on in the evening, but do have a pleasant Easter Monday ahead.